season of Lent comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 through 56. Listen now for God's word to you. And I'm going to warn you that this, uh, this passage kind of cuts off abruptly, so don't be surprised when I end the reading. I'm going to get into, we're going to get into it here in a second, so just be forewarned about that. So this is Jesus speaking to us, and he says, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is complete. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I see the faces. It's going to be okay, I promise. I promise. So the 2006 slapstick comedy, Talladega Nights, is a hilarious parody of, the auto, of auto racing culture. Uh, it stars Will Ferrell as uh, the NASCAR driver, Ricky Bobby. In one of the scenes, Ricky and his wife, Carly, his father-in-law, Chip, his best friend and teammate, Cal, and his two sons that he's named Walker and Texas Ranger, sit down for a feast of Domino's, KFC, and Taco Bell. Before digging into that exquisite feast, Ricky Bobby says grace, and he says this. He says, Dear Lord, baby Jesus, as our, or as our brothers in the South call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful feast of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to thank you for my family, my two beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, and of course, my red-hot smoking wife, Carly, who is a stone-cold fox. You can laugh, it's funny. <laughs> I also want to thank you for my best friend and teammate, Cal Naughton Jr., who has my back no, water, no matter what. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, we thank you for my wife's father, Chip. We hope that you can use your baby Jesus powers to heal him in his horrible leg. It smells terrible and the dogs are always bothering it. Dear tiny infant Jesus, we... And Carly interrupts him. Hey, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Ricky responds, well, I like the Christmas Jesus the best. And I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. Ricky attempts to start the prayer again. Dear tiny Jesus, in your golden fleece diapers, your tiny little fat balled-up fists, Carly's father, Chip, interrupts. He was a man. He had a beard. Ricky's best friend, Cal Naughton Jr., adds, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo T-shirt because it says, I want to be formal, but I also, I'm also here to party because I like to party. So I like my Jesus to party. I also like to think of Jesus with giant eagle's wings and singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with like an, an angel band. And I'm in the front row and I'm singing along. Ricky looks at Cal oddly and attempts to pray for a third time. Okay. Dear eight pounds, six ounce, newborn infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet, yet a little infant and so cuddly, but still omnipotent. And the prayer continues. Now, as funny as I think that that scene is, and as much as I quoted it in my dorm room as a freshman, uh, I think there is some level of truth to this scene. We all have images of Jesus that emerge. We have all of these different ways of encountering Jesus. Now, I don't know how many of you are taking time to pray to the eight-pound, six-ounce baby Jesus, but we do encounter the infant Jesus during the Advent and the Christmas seasons, the, the Jesus who's born in a, in a barn outside of Bethlehem, the, 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 the love of God revealed in the flag, fragile flesh of a child. Over the course of the season of Lent, we've been having our Wednesday Bible study where we've been looking at the book Freeing Jesus by Diana Butler Bass, and she talks about all of these different sorts of images that, that help us to encounter Jesus. There, there's Jesus as friend, and Jesus says that to us in the Gospel of John. I, I consider you to be friends. There's, there's Jesus the teacher, not just the, the dispenser of information, but Jesus the wise sage, Jesus who, who offers us wisdom from God, the way that we're supposed to go in life. There's Jesus the Savior, Jesus who saves us not just from sin, but from all the things that estrange us from God and from one another. 
There's Jesus as Lord, the transcendent figure who rules over and guides history towards its proper end. There's, there's Jesus, the, the shepherd who leads and guides his flock gently and, and lovingly. Jesus' life really is a prism, and the light of God reflects through that prism in a lot of different ways, and a lot of different images emerge from that prism. But I have a sneaking suspicion that the primary image that you carry around is not the one that we encounter here this morning, that Jesus says some things that seem to be rather un-Jesus like. What's going on in this story? Jesus says that there's a fire that it wants to fall and he's ready for it to be kindled. He says that he's come to divide people from one another, mothers from father or mothers from, from their, their children and in-laws from their in-laws, although let's be honest, it doesn't take a whole lot to divide in-laws from one another. Um, and then he asks that question. He says, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? And he answers that question by saying not peace, but division. It's a little odd, right? Isn't this the Jesus who, that Ricky Bobby prays to, who's born in Bethlehem, who is heralded by the angels as the one as who is the Prince of Peace? Isn't this the, the Jesus who sits on the mount, on the, gives a sermon on the mount and says, blessed are the peacemakers. What's going on here in this story? What's going on with Jesus? Did he wake up on the wrong side of the bed that morning? Do uh, you remember those old Snickers commercials where you're not acting like yourself when you're hungry? <laughs> Is Jesus just a little hangry? Does he need a Snickers bar to become like, more like his normal self again? Don't call me sacrilegious. Um, <laughs> but maybe this really is on brand for Jesus. Maybe this isn't all that odd for Jesus to say. Because of all the things that Jesus is, friend, Savior, Lord, Shepherd, Jesus was also a prophet. He's certainly more than a prophet, but he's not less than a prophet. And I think with all of the theological language that we've developed over the course of, of Christian history, that we forget that, that Jesus sits in that long tradition of prophets that we have from the, from the Hebrew Bible. He sits in that tradition with Isaiah and Jeremiah and all of the great prophets of Israel's tradition. And we tend to think of prophets sort of as these people who tell the future, they predict the future, they look into a, a crystal ball, so to speak. And that's kind of the way that we've encountered prophets throughout our Christian history. We encounter that especially during the Advent and Christmas seasons where we read primarily from the, the prophet Isaiah and we read those passages as if Isaiah is predicting the arrival of Jesus 700 years later. Or of course, there's the, the book of Revelation, everyone's favorite book, uh, and people love to hang out in the dark corners of the book of Revelation. They love to have it open while they're watching 24-hour news and say, see, Revelation predicted what's going to happen. But prophets are much less people who predict the future and much more they're like social activists. They're social critics. They're, they're people who are rabble-rousers. They sort of get into to good trouble. Uh, Walter Brueggemann says that prophets, he says this is what a prophet is. Sandy, if you want to bring that quote up for me. We're going to try. All right, that's all I can ask for. Or I can always come back here too. All right, let me come back here. Got to love technology, right? All right, so Walter Brueggemann says this. He says it's in his book, Prophetic Imagination. He says, the task of prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternate, alternate to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. So prophets are people who have this sense of a different sort of future. Now it's up. Perfect. Now you can see it. So prophets are these people who have this sense of consciousness, a sense of an alternative sort of future. And so in that sense, the prophets are people who are future-oriented. They see the world differently. They see the world as it could and should be. And they want to bring some of that future into the present. And when we think about Jesus, Jesus is someone who is captured by a vision, captured by a sort of alternative sort of consciousness. And he called it the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God where all of our expectations are sort of inverted and flipped upside down. The kingdom of God where the first are last and the last are first. The kingdom of God where the, the workers who are hired at the end of the day are paid the same as those who are hired at the beginning of the day. 
the kingdom of God where there is justice for the oppressed, where there's freedom for the captives, where the hungry or hungry are filled with good things, but the, the rich are sent away empty-handed. The kingdom of God where dividing walls are torn down, where, where the outcasts and sinners are gathered around the table. The kingdom of God where those who are blessed are those who make peace, those who are mourning right now, those who are hungry. Jesus really inverts all of our expectations with this vision of the kingdom of God. It's an alternative sort of consciousness that he brings into the presence. And this sort of alternative consciousness, this different view of the future, a future that would arrive if we change course, a future that doesn't arrive simply if we stay on the current course that we're on, this is exactly what makes Jesus a source of conflict and division in the world. You can't talk about the first being last and last being first without those who are already first being a little bit upset. You can't talk about the workers hired at the end of the day being paid the same as those who are hired at the beginning of the day without there being some conversation about sound economic policy. You can't talk about dividing walls being torn down without those who benefit from those walls standing there uh, getting a little bit upset. And so Jesus is this source of tension, this source of conflict. And that's because the prophet, as they have this vision of the future, they are people who are deeply in touch with the pain of the world as it exists right now. That prophets are people who often emerge from the the margins of society. They are people who have often been personally impacted by the injustices and the pain of the present. And so they are people who seek to bring those things out from the periphery and into the view of everybody else. And that is what makes them this source of tension, this source of conflict, those things that are hidden away, the people that society might try to erase, are brought into public view. This is exactly what Martin Luther King talks about in his letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, Every time I mention a letter from a Birmingham jail, the racial justice group can, can tell you this. Every time I mention that, I say, if you haven't read it, you should go and read it. It is in my opinion, and maybe I'm a heretic for saying this, but uh, it's not the first heresy I've said today. Um, <laughs> to me, it's the closest thing that we have to uh, American scripture. It's the closest thing we have as to an uh, epistle to the Americans. You know, we have the epistles of Paul. Um, this, to me, is the closest thing that we have, uh, the most uh, a modern example of that. And so as you can gather from that title, Martin Luther King is writing this letter while he's in prison in Birmingham, Alabama, and he's there because he's been arrested for violating the city ordinance against things like sit-ins and protests and boycotts. Remember the the Birmingham bus boycotts going on during this time. So he's in prison for that. There's a sense, too, that uh, his time in prison was rather rough, that he was kind of mistreated while he was there. And while he's there, this group of eight white clergy, seven pastors and one rabbi, write a letter denouncing the tactics that King and the civil rights movement are taking on at that point. And the thing to remember is that these clergy are sympathetic to the civil rights movement. They want to see the end of Jim Crow. They want to see the end of racial segregation. But what they tell King is that protesting and sit-ins at lunch counters, those are not the way to go about it. Do that through the courts. In other words, keep it hidden from public view. And what King says in that letter is that the goal of those nonviolent protests, those sit-ins at lunch counters, was to create tension. Not that they are the creators of tension, but that they are bringing to the surface the tension that already exists there. That's what a prophet does. But that's what makes prophets difficult for us to encounter. I mean, we We live in a a time and place where the world seems really uncertain, right? Everything feels unsettled, especially the last couple of years. And so we are are looking for those places in our lives where we can feel a little safe and secure, where everything can feel all right. There's a reason why I've watched the television sitcom The Office two dozen times. It makes me feel a little safe and a little secure. It makes me feel like everything is okay. And sometimes we come to our faith looking for our faith to do the same sort of thing, to make us feel safe and secure, like the the ground beneath our feet is a a firm foundation on which we can stand. But the prophet is one who unsettles and disturbs us a little bit. Um, I don't think that Jesus' goal is always for us to feel comfortable. 
I remember that scene from uh, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe where they ask, if, is Aslan safe? And they say, no, he's not safe, but he's, he's good. I think sometimes Jesus' goal is to unsettle us, to, to make us a little bit uncomfortable. We're supposed to be uncomfortable with the things that are, are wrong in the world. Well, with our uncomfortability, sometimes what we do with the prophet is we sort of blunt the sharp edge of their message. Think about Martin Luther King. He's the, the, the person we look to for racial harmony, but we sort of have blunted the edge of that message, the things that we have to do to get to that place of racial harmony. Think about, about Jesus as a prophet. Uh, he has been turned into someone who just tells us how to get to heaven when we die. But instead, he has this, this message of the kingdom of God, this, this sharp edge to what he has to say. And so I think when Jesus asks that question, do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? And then he answers it, not peace, but division. He's asking us to remember that sharp edge of his message, that prophetic edge of his message, that prophetic edge of his message that, that puts us in touch with the pain of the world, that, that calls us to do something about that pain in the world. It might be divisive to work for justice in situations of injustice. It might be divisive to stand up for love in situations of hatred. It might be divisive to talk about, about grace in a society that's obsessed with merits. But those are the very messages of the kingdom of God that Jesus brings to us. Walter Brueggemann says that the goal of the prophet is to uh, inspire imagination, to keep imagination alive. And I think that's what Jesus seeks to do with us, is to keep our imaginations alive. And so when he talks about a fire that's ready to be kindled, maybe the fire that he's ready to kindle is a fire within each one of us a passionate burning for the kingdom of God, a passionate burning for a world of love and justice and, and equity and peace. Because when we think about fire in the Bible, we often think about it as destroying things, right? The fires of judgment. But fire is also there to cultivate. It's also there to form and to transform. It's there to, to animate us. Think about the, the fires of an internal combustion engine, the thing that, that moves us along. I think that Jesus is trying to keep our imaginations alive, to keep our imaginations alive for the kingdom of God, to inspire us to bring the kingdom of God all around us. Sometimes that means we'll be the sources of division. But in that place, that's where the kingdom of God arises. Thanks be to God. Amen.